hope you're doing well today. In the narrated PowerPoint that you looked at earlier, you learned how to do measures of central tendency and variability by hand. Uh, today in this video, you're gonna learn how to do the same thing, except now you're gonna use Microsoft Excel. Please remember that the exams will use Microsoft Excel. So what we learned today will be important for the exam you take next week. But that doesn't mean what you learned in the narrated PowerPoint isn't important. So when we click on buttons in Excel, we don't actually get to see what's going on behind the scenes. So when you do it by hand, you know exactly what the computer is doing. And that's important for your knowledge and for understanding statistics and what's going on behind the numbers when it comes to interpreting data. As before, you'll find two files below. There will be the spreadsheet that we'll use for today and also a step-by-step -step directions in a Microsoft Word document. So the data set for today will seem very similar. It's the same question that we're working with yesterday. So we're still asking about dollars spent on coffee in a week, but it will be slightly different in that in this case, we have added your responses from the beginning of the semester. So notice that our participant numbers increase now to it looks like 101. We have a slightly larger data set than we were working with uh, yesterday. It is also good practice to always look for empty cells. It looks like there's that one from yesterday. There was no new ones when we added the, the new data from this semester. So we want to go ahead and push that empty cell down to the bottom of the screen. And so we're going to go ahead and left click on B. At this point, you should have this down. We'll go to our sort and filter. Um, I like to do smallest and largest, so we'll go ahead and do that. And just make sure that it, say, it says expand the selection. We'll click sort. And now we're going to find that empty cell at the bottom. So again, this won't impact our results for today. Uh, but next week, when we start getting Z scores and doing transforms, uh, it will be important. So we just want to make sure that we get in the habit now and move those blank cells down to the bottom. All right. So before we get into our directions for today, we do want to make sure that we have a data analysis tool pack installed onto our Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I have posted those directions in the modules page. It should be right below this link here for this online lecture. To check to see if that add-on is installed, we're going to go up to the data tab at the top of our spreadsheet. We'll click on it. And we're going to go to the far right. And if we have that data analysis tool pack, we should have this icon here on the far right that says data analysis. If that is not there, then that means you need to add it into your Excel spreadsheet. Now you should only have to do it once per computer, but realize you definitely want to check that, especially before an exam, make sure that data analysis icon is there. If not, then you'll have to install it. Um, hopefully your proctor will have that installed already for you. If it is not installed, it's not very difficult to get it onto your Excel spreadsheet. All you have to do is go to File, click on Options, go to Add-ins, then you want to click on Manage Excel Add-ins, you'll press Go, and then you'll check the boxes for Analysis Toolpack, Analysis Toolpack BBA. And then you click OK, and that should install it into your Excel spreadsheet. So just so you see that process, I'll walk through it with you. You would go to File, we would scroll down to Options, we click on Options, and then we would go down to Add-ins in the left-hand bar. And then we would click on Analysis Toolpack or Analysis Toolpack VBA, either one of those, go ahead and click on it and then press Go. And you'll see that'll show up in the Add-ins Available box. And you can check them. So the Analysis Toolpack, Analysis Toolpack VBA, and then you just hit OK. And then if it wasn't installed, it would now show up again on that da data tab at the top of your Excel spreadsheet. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into getting our measures of central tendency and measures of variability. If you're looking at your Word document that has the directions on it, you see the very first step is getting those measures of central tendency and variability. We're gonna check, make sure we have the Excel add-ins to get our descriptive statistics. And then we're gonna go to that data tab at the top. We'll click that data analysis icon. We'll then select descriptive statistics and click okay. Once we do that, we'll need to input the data range, and this will include the label at the very top of our data. We'll have to check the box that says labels in the first row, and then we need to indicate where we want to put that output. And very lastly, don't forget to check the box summary statistics. That's what's going to give you those measures of central tendency and measures of variability. Once you do that, click OK, and then you'll get some output that'll have everything you need in it. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to Excel. So again, we're gonna go up to our data tab at the top. 
So if you're on the Home tab, you'll need to switch to the Data tab. We'll go to the right. We'll click on our Data Analysis tab. In there, you see a, a list of statistics that we can do. The one that we want is Descriptive Statistics, so we'll click on that and press OK. Then we get this dialog box that opens up. We need to indicate the data that we want to do the analysis with. And so all I'm going to do here is I'm just going to click on the column B. So not on the labels, not on the numbers, but on that B at the very top. And this is going to highlight that entire column. Now we do have a label in that very first row. And so we need to make sure we click labels in the first row. If not, it'll give us an error. Next thing we want to do is we want to identify where we want to put the output. So we'll click on that output radial dial. Then I'm going to click inside the box. I'm going to select someplace on my spreadsheet to put this output. Now again, just like it was yesterday, uh, definitely give yourself some space. Next week we'll do some transforms and doing z-scores, so you're going to need uh, some of these columns. So uh, I'm just going to put it in G3. That'll give us plenty of room in case we have to do any kind of data manipulation. All right, and then the last thing, make sure you click that summary statistics box. And then once you've done that, you can go ahead and click OK, and you'll get your output. Once you get your output, you'll notice that the names of your statistics are a little bit crammed in there. Remember, I showed you how you can widen that cell if you just go up between, in this case, G and H, and hover between it until you get that line with two arrows. You can left click hold and you can expand that cell. So I'll go ahead and, and do that. Um, another way that you can do it is once you get that line with two arrows, you can double click it and it'll automatically space that uh, column for you so that it fits all the words that are in that particular column. Once you have your data, you'll notice that you have some measures of central tendency. Here is your mean. We have a median, it looks like of 10, and it looks like we have a mode of zero. Now something to be careful about when it comes to this mode is that it's only going to show one value. So if you have multiple modes, it's not going to show you all those multiple modes. So uh, I recommend that you look at the value that is provided. In this case, it's a zero. And then go back and look at your data set really quick and just get a quick count of how many zeros you have. So I'm just going to left click hold. I'm going to highlight all the zeros. And you'll notice that as you do that, uh, there's a count for the rows. That's actually going to be also the count for the number of zeros that you have. There's also a count at the bottom that tells you how many cells are highlighted. In this case, there's 26. So we have 26 zeros. So we can go through, just look through our data really quick and make sure there's no other value that has 26 values with it. And it doesn't look like anything's really close. We have a lot of 10s, a lot of 15s, but nothing that's going to be close to the number of 26 values uh, for any one of those those uh, numbers. So it looks like in this case, a mode of zero is what we would want to report if we were asked for the mode. Now we also have some measures of central tendency in here. Notice that we have a standard deviation. We have a variance. And we have a range. Something that you'll need to make sure that you note is that the standard deviation and the variance here are for a sample, not for a population. And there is a slight difference in the formulas for uh, both the sample versus the population standard deviation and the sample versus the population variance. Of course, these two are related to each other in that the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. So I'll show you really quickly what that difference in formula is. So what you've learned in the narrated PowerPoint is that when I have a variance, the formula is sigma squared equals the sum of each value in the data set minus mu or the mean in the population. We then divide by n. The formula that Excel is calculating is s squared. It's still variance, but it's variance of a sample. And the top part of that formula stays the same, except we use the mean of the sample rather than the mean of the population. And then we divide instead of by n, rather by n minus one, or what we call the degrees of freedom. Now we'll learn more about degrees of freedom later in the semester, but just realize that calculations are slightly different. So we wanna make sure that when we get those measures of central tendency and measures of variability in our Excel output, that we make the adjustment 
if we have population data. And I'll show you how to make that adjustment uh, as well. So back at our spreadsheet, if we wanted to get the population standard deviation, we can type in a formula and it equals STDEVP, and that stands for standard deviation population. And then we can do an open parentheses. Now, once we do that, we now have to select our data. Now, we just want the numbers here. We don't want the labels. We can highlight all of our values in our data set. And we just did that by left clicking on the first one, holding and dragging. And then we're going to close the parentheses and hit enter. And that's going to give us the population standard deviation. And it should be a value that's slightly smaller than the standard deviation for the sample. And we see that here as well. And that comes from the denominator being slightly smaller when it comes to our calculations. So you'll see that also in our directions right here under the note that the output gives you a sample standard deviation. If you want that population standard deviation, then you need to type in the command equals STDEVP, open parentheses, select your data, close parentheses. You can also do that for variance. And so instead of STDEVP, you would do VAR for variance, then P. So VARP, open parentheses, close parentheses, and that'll give you the population variance. Let's do that really quickly in Excel. So I'll just put that population variance right below it. So again, assuming we had population data here, we do VARP, open parentheses, do exactly the same thing. So we'll right click hold, highlight all of our values in our data set, close parentheses, hit enter, and there is our population variance. Again, the relationship between the two is still the same, that if I square 13.44, I'm gonna get 180.67, or vice versa, if I square root 180.67, I'm gonna get 13.44. So you don't necessarily need to remember the, for, the formula equals VARP when it comes to getting that population variance. If you remember that all you need to do is square your standard deviation, you can always go to another cell, hit equals, click on the cell, press the asterisk button, click on the cell again, hit enter, and you're gonna get that population variance. So whatever is easiest for you, I've shown you two different ways that you can get that population variance but you will need to know that going in into the exam. Uh, if you don't have a sample data, you will need to count, calculate the population, standard deviation, population variance. So going back to our Word document, the last thing we wanna do is we wanna check the skewness of the variable. And so most of the tests that we perform this semester are gonna assume a normal distribution. And so what we wanna know is that, can we assume the data we have in the population is normal enough to meet that assumption? And so we do have a skewness statistic in our output. The formula is slightly different than the one that you learned by hand. So the value would be slightly different if you try to do by hand and compared it to the table. Uh, the one in Excel is a better estimate than the one that you learned in the narrated PowerPoint. We're gonna take that value and we're gonna compare it to our table just like we did uh, in the narrated PowerPoint. And if that value falls between the values in our table, then we're gonna assume it's a normal distribution. If it falls outside, then it can be a positive or a negative distribution. So let's take a look at our skewness statistic for these data here. So I go back to my output, you'll see skewness is in that output. That is your skewness statistic. I'll give it a different color here. In this case, it's 1.93. Now I don't need to look at my table to know that this is a positive skew, but we'll still walk through it anyway, just so that we're all on the same page. So in this particular case, we have a count of 100. Remember we had one blank cell. So make sure you're using the count of the actual values, not the count of the participant identification numbers. We want to count the actual values that we have in our data set. In this case, we have 100. So we can go over to our table, and we see here that in our table, we have this very last column of 100 plus. And so if we could assume that this was a normal distribution, we would expect that skewness statistic to be between plus and minus 0.37. So notice that this range is centered at zero. If we go beyond a positive 0.37, we're gonna say we have a positive skew. If we have less than negative 0.37, we're gonna say it's a negative skew. So in this case, 1.928 or 1.93 is definitely higher than 0.37.
So in this case, we would conclude that we have a positive skew with our data. Now, don't forget when it comes to determining whether you have a normal distribution or a skew distribution, the skew statistic is just one piece of evidence. In the online uh, lecture, we talked about two other uh, pieces of evidence. One is comparing your mean to your median, and then also looking at your graph. So make sure you review that in that narrated PowerPoint and make sure that you're including all of the evidences when it comes to determining whether or not you have normality in your data. Okay, so that's it when it comes to getting your measures of central tendency and measures of variability in Microsoft Excel. Please remember to upload your spreadsheet with your name as the file name and submit it below.